Welcome, everybody. We're going to start the webinar now. Um, this is the first webinar in the series for the program Mobilizing Investment for NDC Implementation. The program is funded by the German government under the International Climate Initiative and is a collaboration between South South North, with the lead organization based out of Cape Town, PwC in London, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Denver, USA, and ODI in London. The next webinar in the series is scheduled for mid-June and will cover integrated governance in Peru. And you will receive a, an invite for that. My name is, is, sorry, my name is John Thorne and um, I'll be facilitating the session today. Our panelists are Arij Riaz from CDK in Toronto and Arij, Arij will be discussing our work in Bangladesh. Yasomi Ranasinghe from PwC in London will be talking to the, the program in Peru. Kamlashan Pillay from South South North in Cape Town who's sitting next to me will be taking us through progress in Kenya and Ethiopia. And Bethany Spear from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Denver will be discussing Dominican Republic, Vietnam and Philippines. So on to a, a, a short session about housekeeping rules for this webinar. Our panelists today will be presenting a series of short, um, short presentations on each country. We will only be exchanging questions and answers after all the presentations have been made. So if you'd like to submit a question, you press the QA button, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom webinar interface. And please note the particular panelist or the country to, to whom you'd like to address the question. We'll screen the questions and relay them verbally to the panelist. We'll answer as many as we can and any that we haven't managed to answer, we will do so afterwards. Okay. Um, lastly, this will be published to the South South North and CDKN uh, website. And so you can get access it, to it at a later stage. On to the uh, webinar agenda for today. Our aim is to provide an overview of the program and discuss progress and emerging lessons. We have 40 slides. Subsequent webinars will take a deeper dive into, into countries. I've asked the panelists not to exceed uh, more than seven minutes per country. We aim to leave about 20 to 30 minutes at the end for questions. So please note down anything you, you'd like to ask. So this program was born out of a collaboration between CDK and LEDS, LEDS GP. And for those not familiar with these programs, um, we'll provide a, a, an introduction to each of them shortly. I'll provide a quick program overview, and then we'll dive down into each of the countries and the, our panelists will take you through the work that we've been doing in those, in those countries before we move on to questions. All right. Um, so, CD Ken, I'd like to talk briefly about CD Ken. CD Ken is a is um, is a one of the, the the programs that initiated this 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 particular program. The Climate and Development Knowledge Network was established in 2010. It was funded uh, by the British and Dutch governments. Initially, it was led out of, uh, led by P PwC in London, with South South North coordinating the sub-Saharan Africa work. Now it's in phase two, it's a, it's a smaller program funded by the Canadian and Dutch governments and led out of South South North's offices in Cape Town together with partners Fundesio Futuro in Latin America, ICLI in South, in South Asia and ODI in London. And the focus of phase two is on knowledge and peer learning, making information learning on climate cap compatible development easier to access and use and supporting the uptake of relevant research. You can see the CD can priority countries on the at the top right, and priority themes are represented in the diagram, the bottom left, uh, the, the food, water, energy nexus, climate finance, gender, and social inclusion, cities and urban resilience. Okay, I'd, I'd like to hand over to Bethany Spear just to talk us through the um, the LEDS Global Partnership. Yeah, great. Thanks, John. Uh, so the Let's Global Partnership, uh, again, kind of one of the key uh, learning partners for this effort that we're discussing with you today. 
The LEDS Global Partnership, or LEDS GP for short, uh, facilitates collaboration across more than 350 countries and international organizations um, to really do joint work, uh, learning, de development of tools and approaches uh, that can help national and subnational governments um, develop and put together low emission development strategies uh, and other sectoral uh, policies and programs. Uh, so we really facilitate this work through four regional platforms. Uh, we have one in Asia, uh, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, um, as, well, as well as Europe and Eurasia. We also have uh, several cross-cutting global working groups that provide technical support, training, and tools. Uh, and so you see some of those uh, listed here, um, including subnational and national integration, uh, finance mobilization, uh, and then sectoral working groups. We also have a variety of communities of practice um, that go deeper into specific topics and are typically organized regionally. So uh, we have uh, one, for example, in Asia on, um, on renewable energy finance. Uh, we have one on transport uh, and e-mobility and several others. Uh, but with that, I'll hand it back to John. Thank you, Bethany. Oops, sorry. Okay, before we zoom into the specifics of the program, I think it's important that we spend a little time looking at the broader climate finance environment. So as you are all aware, we are entering a, a critical period in the fight against climate change. We really have the next decade and this is gonna require large amounts of, pro, uh, of capital, both from the, the public and, and private sectors. How much we can only guess. Uh, a number of estimations out there. And importantly, country climate action commitments contained in NDCs and submitted as part of the Paris Agreement won't get us to where we need to be, but they are a necessary start. And the Paris Agreement has a, has a mechanism to ramp up ambition. In the developing world and in countries that are the focus of this program, much of the ambition contained in country NDCs are conditional on receiving financial support. So I think this, that's really important. From the perspective of, the, of the, the private sector, if these barriers can be overcome, this represents a potential pipeline of investable projects. So what are these barriers? This is a complex system and there are no quick fixes, unfortunately. But if a leverage point exists in this complex system, it's policy reform. And, and you'll see later that much of the work in this program is aimed at addressing policy blockers to investment. And a good example of how policy combined with capacity and public sector finance has been, un unable, has been able to unlock a market is the, uh, is, is the example of South Africa's renewable energy program, where the, the policy was contained in a, a renewable energy independent power producers program. Um, cap capacity was addressed through uh, a dedicated office of skilled technocrats who were versed in um, public-private partnerships, and government offered sovereign guarantees to back up the, the PPAs, and this unlocked the sector, which is, has proven successful. All right, so, so moving on, let's have a look at the seven countries across the Americas, Africa, and Asia that are the focus of this program. Um, we've got Peru and Dominican Republic in the Americas, Ethiopia and Kenya in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Bangladesh and Vietnam and Philippines in Asia. And I think it's important to note that these countries represent some of the most vulnerable, vulnerable countries globally to climate change. Okay, moving on. Looking at the, uh, looking at the project overview by... Um, sectors and subsectors by country. I think the important thing here is that all countries, in all countries, we're engaging in the, in the energy sector. And this came out of the, the scoping studies and engagements, and so it was largely demand-driven. Demand um, although the project wasn't designed to focus um, on the, uh, exclusively on the energy sector, this is, what, this is what has emerged in our engagements with stakeholders in country. And on a macro scale, this represents what's happening in the climate finance world, where the majority of funding is going towards energy sector mitigation business models. And, and, and that's largely to be expected. Energy business models are generally more mature. They're easier to fund. 
and this is positive for the energy energy sector, but in, in some respects represents some of the challenging some of the challenges funding non-energy NDCs, and particularly those that relate to adaptation. And so, um, okay, I think we want, uh, let me just look at, the, look at the countries quickly. So in Kenya, we're looking at um, bioethanol. In e Ethiopia, we're looking to um, grow the, the mini-grid sector. Bangladesh, similarly, mini-grid, off-grid solar pumps and um, uh, water transport. Peru, we're looking at waste management and waste to energy. In Dominican Republic, energy efficiency and renewable energy. And similarly, renewable energy in both Vietnam and the Philippines. Oops, sorry. For some reason I can't, my down button isn't working. Um, Okay, project overview. I, I'm not going to go into this in, in detail, but here's a summary of the results framework. So the impact we, we are trying to, cr we're looking to have is uh, aiming to mobilize private finance for NDC implementation. There are three main outputs, investment mobilization measures, pipelines for investment, and scale up and scale out innovation from emergent practice. Okay, I think, um, I'm going to move on to Bangladesh and hand over to Areej Riaz from um, CDKN in Toronto. Areej. Thank you, John. Um, so Bangladesh wants to become a middle-income country by 2021, which means accelerated economic development for all of its economic sectors, but also um, particularly stands true for power transport and industry. Um, and these are the sectors which also make the basis of their climate action plan. So this is pretty much where we begin our work. Uh, next slide, please. In 2017, we began scoping um, from among the three power transport and industry sectors, um, the one that had the most potential for private sector involvement based on the findings from the scoping exercises and stakeholder engagements um, off-grid solar energy was selected. Um, and we looked at three of the technologies from this sector. So mini grids, irrigation pumps, and uh, solar boats. The first two steps uh, included studying the aspects that have hindered technology development for these three technologies. Um, or uh, created barriers to investment in technology upscaling. And we also looked at examples of other countries with similar kind of contexts like Nepal, India, um, but also in some cases, Kenya, where they may have found some um, low hanging fruits or um, some major kind of innovative solutions um, to remove these barriers for market development. These uh, studies shaped the business models for each of the three technologies, setting out the different kind of constituent parameters which could be altered um, so we could overcome those barriers to market development and look at options for finance and implementation within the existing energy and climate change policy and regulatory framework. So this was basically just a means to improve the short term kind of bankability of uh, the projects for these three technologies. The recommended changes um, were then expanded into investment cases that show the financial impacts of each recommended change and also the financial opportunities that these technologies present uh, to project sponsors, financiers and government stakeholders. And then we also made some major um, overall broader four to five key policy or regulatory um, recommendations to the government. Um, so to date, uh, 22 mini grids and 1131 irrigation pumps have been deployed in Bangladesh. Um, the main kind of financing is public sourced and public crowded, and it's led by the public uh, companies such as the infrastructure development company, the Central Bank of Bangladesh, the Bangladesh Agriculture Development Corporation. Um, and they're largely made up of grant components, um, 
using both the public budget, but also donations from development partners. So because of these grant components, private investors like commercial banks, they can't compete with these financing schemes. Um, but also because the investors are looking for risk-free investments um, and not every private project developer has guarantees to provide for such loans. There are obviously other factors that uh, have also limited private sector involvement in this sector in Bangladesh. Um, and they range from lack of awareness of investment opportunity um, to uncertainty around um, policies of the government, for instance, on grid expansion. Um, also, the uncertainty around the financing schemes and some more technical kind of issues around the seasonality of irrigation demand, uh, which means that you can't really use the irrigation pumps for um, the whole of the year because you can't really uh, sell the surplus power. There aren't enough regulations in Bangladesh to do that just yet. Um, so the recommendations that we've made to mobilize finance include improving rate of returns by using some more sensitive and robust analysis. Um, also increasing this customer subset from the business, commercial and industry sector, because um, that's where there's more, there's higher demand and it's also a bit more stable than the household customers. Um, and also by lowering operational and maintenance costs. And lastly, uh, we've also learned that solar boats is a very nascent technology. It's, it's still in its infancy, um, not just only in Bangladesh, but across the globe. So there are a lot of like technical design challenges uh, that need to be studied first. Um, there are also a lot of market investment challenges that need to be explored first uh, before we can truly understand the investment opportunity that they bring to an investor. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So the uh, government of Bangladesh's uh, infrastructure development company called ITCO has plans to finance 200 mini grids and 50,000 irrigation pumps in the next seven years. So they need a lot of commercial finance to support this goal. Um, there, there are obviously a lot of recommendations that we gave to the government and some of them that they're already taking strides to work with um, is um, SREDA, uh, which is the Renewable Energy Development Authority in Bangladesh, and the infrastructure development company, ITCO, are now working with private project developers to explore the challenges that they have been facing uh, when they develop, operate, or implement the projects. Um, SREDA and the power division are also now considering a, a net metering policy for the off-grid sector. So for the more commercial projects um, and also looking at compensation guidelines um, in case of grid expansion to these areas. Um, for solar boats, Strada is working with UNDP on studying the technical designs and they're also working with the private um, uh, entity Rahima Froze to explore a range of commercial business models for solar ferries. Um, and to further improve the investment environment in these technologies, especially in the solar irrigation area, um, we are now working with Shreda to develop a, a dynamic decision-making tool, um, a geospatial modeling uh, tool, uh, which is going to help in their policy and investment decisions. Um, it's going to be a one-stop shop to get answers on where there is more uh, irrigation demand, water availability, suitable soil, grid expansion plans to plan uh, the more ideal uh, locations for solar irrigation pumps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arij. Um, we are now going to hand over to Yasami Ranasinga in London, PwC in London, to take us through the work in Peru. Yasami, are, are you there? We can't hear you yet.
Okay, I think um, clearly Yasumi has got some technical issues there. So I think we're going to move straight on then to Kenya. I'm going to hand over to my colleague and we'll come back. Yasumi, uh, we'll, we'll try you again at the end of this, in fact, after Ethiopia. So, Um, good day, everyone, uh, wherever you are. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you about our Kenyan and Ethiopian experience. Um, just like to note at first that the Ethiopian work program is slightly behind. So the developments that I'll share with you are more of the initial findings rather than the Kenyan experience, which has um, transpired quite quickly, especially over the last year. So um, I'll just start off with some context. Um, traditionally in Kenya, dirty fuels continue to be the reliant uh, form of energy um, with fuel types such as charcoal, kerosene, and firewood still dominating the energy mix. Um, bioethanol may provide an answer to one of the long-standing issues that are prevalent on the continent, which is clean cooking. Um, within Kenya, we have worked with private, a private sector organization and the private sector at large to try and unlock this energy fuel type that can deliver um, co-benefits and also mitigation benefits over time, as well as relieve some of the issues such as indoor air quality um, health hazards, um, as well as deforestation, which is a priority of the Kenyan government. So um, I just want to touch on a few facts here about the issues or the impacts that are prevalent with regards to dirty cooking fuel. Um, in Kenya, um, the use of kerosene and charcoal is responsible for eight to 10% of early deaths. Um, from a deforestation perspective, Kenya loses about 10.3 million uh, um, cubic meters of wood from forests every year. And from a food insecurity perspective, um, deforestation exacerbates food insecurity and harms, agriculture, uh, harms the agriculture sector. Um, it's important at this point to note that bioethanol, even though there is a lot of rhetoric um, regarding the food insecurity um, versus bioethanol issue where you know food crops are not seen to be viable for the use for for the production of bioethanol within the kenyan context bioethanol will be mostly produced by waste residues from the sugarcane industry um, and possibly from the cassava industry as well so just to talk about the progress the um the progress that we've made in country um, Initially, we had to undertake a scoping study as per our methodology to find out which type of um, sector or subsector we would like, to, we, you know, we were going to investigate further. Initially, we looked at three, which were bioethanol, microforestry, and mini grids, and decided that bioethanol would be one of the you know, one of the, the sub subsector solutions because we saw great potential in terms of scaling up, considering that buy-in from private sector was already available from, notably from Cocoa Networks, which is a private sector organization, which, you know, ultimately controls and uh, operates about 95% of the market share. We then scoped out what were the prevalent issues regarding unlocking bioethanol as a, you know, a mainstream energy source. And, and there, are various, there are various complications regarding this. From an economic perspective, bioethanol, the price point of bioethanol is not competitive with kerosene and, and firewood. In the long term, it's expected that firewood you know, in, in the rural areas will continue to be the major source of energy. However, within the urban poor, within, within Nairobi specifically, bioethanol may represent an opportunity to provide 
residents with a cleaner cooking fuel option that can negate some of the negative consequences. So one of the major issues with unlocking the bioethanol industry is the price point, as, as I mentioned. And to unlock this price point, we looked at what were the economic drivers that caused the price point of bioethanol to not be competitive with kerosene. And this is mainly due to two factors. It's the VAT that is charged on bioethanol, as well as the import tariff and duties that are charged on bioethanol that are entering the country that are sold. Working with the organization Coco Networks, we've managed to create a solution that allows for uh, bioethanol to be priced in a way that allows it to be competitive with kerosene. Together with this, they have managed to unlock a distribution system, which you know, in, in, in layman's terms, encompasses the use of bioethanol ATMs at local corner stores to provide a streamlined distribution system, thereby cutting down costs even further. The coupling of adjusting tariffs and taxation policies, as well as zero VAT ratings, can allow for bioethanol to be competitive with um, or with kerosene in the long term. At the moment, um, our, st our, our work program in, encompassed um, engaging a consulting firm, Dahlberg, to undertake a triple bottom line study of, the, of these benefits and try to illustrate to the Kenyan government and other stakeholders the benefit of transitioning away from dirty cooking fuels to bioethanol. The second work program, which we are currently working on, is about working with government to understand how, these how, these, how this policy reform can deliver benefits economically and thereby unlock benefits in the long term. Under the next step section, you'll see that SSN is currently engaging the different ministries within the government of Kenya to develop a bioethanol master plan. I think even though we have stated that unlocking bioethanol is imperative in the short term because it can deliver environmental, social, and economic benefits, in the long term, it needs to be realized that there will be losers from the transition away from charcoal. And therefore, a comprehensive sector plan is necessary to make sure that the long term benefits of transitioning to bioethanol are realized. Um, SSN will also be conducting uh, learning events um, to assist private sector organizations to scale up the demand for bioethanol. We recognize that monopolies are not the answer within, within any country context, and therefore we, we you know, will use our, our resources to support other private sector organizations in the bioethanol space who are looking to scale up the demand for bioethanol and engage as Coco Networks has done as well in the bioethanol sector at large. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on Ethiopia um, briefly as well. Um, our Ethiopian um, um, focus area is on off-grid or mini-grids. Um, and we chose, you know, I, sh I should caveat this by saying that Ethiopia's private sector is, is, is significantly underdeveloped as compared to Kenya. And therefore, it made the scoping, study, the scoping exercise quite difficult to try and realize what type of subsector solutions would be viable for attracting private sector investment. We've chosen mini grids, and I should say at this point as well that even though mini grids show great potential, significant work is needed on, policy, on the policy reform side to ensure that this becomes a scalable solution in the long term. However, we chose this because the government of Kenya has a very ambitious plan to reach 50% of energy access um, using mini grids to the rural poor in, in Ethiopia. And currently, you know, this has not been realized to the extent that it, should, that it could be to realize that goal in 2050. Some of the issues that 
you know, really drive this, um, drive this is the, it's the lack of financial resources, which, which is quite obvious, but it's also things like the tariff structures within Ethiopia, licensing constraints, as well as human capacity within government and within the private sector at large. Given the tariff structures of um, electricity within Ethiopia, um, it is quite difficult to make mini grids viable in terms of financing um, because the return on investment may not be attractive given the low tariff structures. However, um, SSN has recognized that mini grids could be a useful avenue if the financial models are unpacked in a way to give the Ethiopian government guidance on what financial models need to be implemented to make sure that the private sector is crowded in. So the progress up to, uh, uh, you know, up to this point um, includes, uh, as with Kenya, a detailed scoping study. Um, within this, we looked at the industry parks within, within Ethiopia, um, as well as bioethanol solutions um, and, and various other private sector sub, subsectors. Um, the mapping study that was initially taken kind of wanted to unpack the different policies and regulations that are prevalent within the mini grid space, as well as the stakeholders that would be um, involved. Um, it's important to note that the stakeholders, you know, including the private sector is quite limited within the mini grid space, but it isn't for a lack of demand from these, um, from these players. Um, stakeholders, um, in the private sector noted that licensing constraints as well as access to finance were some of the major barriers to, to making mini grids viable in the long term. Our main work program that we're currently focusing on is the development of a financial model to assist the government of Ethiopia um, in terms of decision making. Um, what this model will do is it will take into account the specific Ethiopian context in terms of, of the economic policies, but also in terms of tariff structures to create scenarios where different mini grids will be viable under different conditions, therefore um, allowing for the Ethiopian government to gain more insight into the licensing um, uh, the licensing uh, procedures that can follow, therefore attracting the private sector. In terms of next steps, we'll also be facilitating country exchanges with uh, the Ethiopian government with other countries which have more well-developed uh, mini-grid sectors, um, as well as capacity building in the later stages of the project um, that will deal specifically with licensing for mini-grid programs uh, and projects. Um, I'll hand over back to John and he'll take you through the rest of the program. Thank you, Kamlashan. Um, that was interesting. I think we're going to press on with um, the Dominican Republic and Bethany. Bethany Spear in, in, at uh, Enrol in Denver, Colorado. We're going to hand over to Bethany to take us through Dominican Republic, followed by Philippines and then Vietnam. Bethany, over to you. Thank you, John. And uh, yeah, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning to everyone. Um, so yes, diving into the Dominican Republic. Uh, this is just a photo of a recent uh, delegation of um, folks from uh, the Ministry of Energy and Mines and various other energy uh, stakeholder agencies within the DR uh, who visited the lab uh, to do a bit of uh, technical training. I'll talk a bit about that more. Uh, next slide. So in terms of our, our approach, um, for all three countries, we really, of course, sought to align with, with not only the NDC, um, but also other uh, key national uh, policies, plans, and strategies. Um, so this includes in the DR, um, the NDC Action Plan, uh, which seeks to increase deployment of energy efficiency and participation of non-conventional renewable energies, um, and also um, alignment with a draft bill um, being put forth uh, to reduce uh, energy usage uh, specifically by 13.2% uh, by 2020. 
30. So some very ambitious plans um, in the DR that we wanted to try to uh, help support uh, through various activities. Um, so in terms of kind of identifying the challenges and areas where we thought we could add value, uh, we did consult with uh, many government partners, development partners, and, and industry as well um, to really determine what the barriers were and, and uh, how we could um, help facilitate uh, driving private sector investment into these technologies. Um, so I won't uh, discuss all these partners in detail, but I'll just highlight um, that, of course, the, the Ministry of Energy Mines has really been a key partner to us. Um, we've also been working um, closely with other uh, electricity and kind of power system stakeholders in the country. Um, and the GIZ uh, DR office has also uh, been a really strong uh, facilitator of our work. So some of the challenges that uh, we're hoping to help address are um, the fact that the DR relies on imported fossil fuel, um, which results in very high energy costs. Uh, there's also a lack of effective uh, policies and regulations uh, to support both energy efficiency and to some degree renewable energy, although the renewable energy is also taking off in, in some regards. Next slide. So uh, in terms of progress to date, uh, we have done a few trainings with government partners in the Dominican Republic. Um, so one was a, a workshop uh, held at our lab uh, that really centered around uh, tools for renewable energy development, um, policies, and grid integration studies as well. Um, so brought in not only the Ministry of Energy and Mines, but um, the superintendents of electricity, National Energy Commission, um, and representatives from distribution companies as well. Uh, we've also done training centering around um, energy resiliency. Uh, this is in response to recent hurricanes and um, anticipation of, of um, more and uh, more frequent and more severe storms going forward. Uh, we also did some training around carbon pricing. Another effort that we've undertaken is to scope a robust um, analysis that centers around net metering or the regulation to enable uh, excess solar to be sold back into the grid. And we've been establishing partnerships uh, with industrial groups um, like the Association of, of Industrials and the DR um, AIRD and, and EcoRed, which is a group of uh, eco-minded companies. Next slide. Um, so in terms of, of some of uh, what we've learned to date, um, kind of echoing some of the themes you may have heard earlier in the, the presentation, um, but in terms of, of kind of on the uh, energy efficiency front and uh, barriers related to kind of um, government, public institutions, um, to date there's kind of a lack of national um, planning and incentives, mandates, performance standards, and building codes to really require or incentivize uh, energy efficiency investments. Um, and from the private sector view, uh, you know, some developers lack working capital to really um, support these upfront investments. Um, there may be a lack of capacity to accurately assess and identify energy efficiency projects. Uh, there's also ongoing structural challenges in the energy sector, um, high interest rates for loans, as well as challenges getting long-term loans. For renewable energy, um, some of the challenges surround um, the interconnection process for connecting the, the projects to the grid and tariffs associated with doing that. Um, some other areas uh, that could be improved would be um, utilization of advanced utility rate structures like time of use uh, that vary depending on when peak demand is. Um, also mechanisms to improve how much, um, how much uh, power that utility distribution lines can convey efficiently. There also may be ways to modernize the grid to help integrate more distributed generation. Um, and facilitation of pilot projects um, with customer-cited resources. Next slide. 
Um, in terms of next steps, so um, on kind of engaging with investors or what we call purchasers, um, we will be working with uh, industrial groups and their member companies to gather data and analyze the business case. Um, we'll also be conducting um, a select number of energy audits to confirm those investment opportunities. Um, then we'll be feeding that uh, information into um, really working um, also on the policy side to help uh, government partners understand um, what they could do to help further enable those energy efficiency investments. Uh, we'll also be coordinating some broader clean energy policy technical assistance through the GIZ uh, DR office, um, which is also supported um, by German ICI. And we'll be working with public sector financial institutions to design an energy efficiency finance facility. Um, so taking that data and the investment case information, we'll be feeding that into training with the companies. Um, and also supporting regional learning and replication um, through uh, regional platforms, the Let's Lack and, and other uh, mechanisms. Uh, next slide. So for the next uh, two countries that I'll be speaking to, um, the Philippines and the Vietnam, um, those uh, efforts are kind of under a broader program uh, that I wanted to just introduce very quickly. Uh, which is called the Clean Energy Investment Accelerator. And that really seeks to address barriers to investment in the commercial and industrial sectors um, into renewable energy. So really working with um, companies that have made commitments to go 100% renewable energy or other um, large commitments and helping them uh, be able to buy that renewable energy um, and make other clean energy investments wherever they have facilities throughout the world. So we're doing this work uh, in partnership uh, with others. Uh, we have uh, three co-leads for the effort. Um, so this includes the World Resources Institute, Alatro Partners, as well as NREL. Um, and in addition to Vietnam and the Philippines, we're also doing uh, similar efforts in Indonesia, Mexico, and Colombia. And uh, we're supported um, not only by German Nikki, but also the US government and the Partnership for Growth. This work basically centers around kind of three key pillars that are listed here. Um, pipeline, so identifying investment ready projects, purchasers convening and identifying kind of the level of demand in a market to help create a clear signal um, to investors. And policy, working with government and utility partners to help improve the enabling environment. Next slide. And so for the Philippines, uh, these are some photos from uh, recent trainings that we've done uh, in Santa Rosa City with companies, and then up in Luzon with uh, rural cooperatives. And I'll speak a bit more to those efforts. Next slide. So similarly to the DR, the Philippines also has um, ambitious goals, uh, not only to reduce emissions through its NDC, but has a number of other um, policy efforts underway. Uh, so one particular policy that we are seeking to support um, them in implementing is the new renewable portfolio of standards um, that requires utilities to procure 30%, 35% um, of the total consumed energy from uh, qualifying renewable energy resources by 2030. Um, However, you know, there's several challenges to doing this. One is that uh, the Philippines, um, you know, they have over 120 distribution utilities. So that's a lot of different um, stakeholders that need to uh, really be up to speed in order to um, understand the implications of the RPS and uh, the different ways that they can help meet that. Um, however, the RPS seeks to, to help address um, several kind of um, bigger challenges within the power system in the Philippines. Um, this includes the, the Philippines uh, sees the highest energy costs in all of Southeast Asia. Um, and they're trying to meet really uh, quickly a growing electricity demand. Um, they have to triple their installed capacity uh, in the next 20 years to meet this demand. So really just need to build out um, quite a bit more um, electricity capacity in terms of new plants. 
Um, but they plan on doing this through uh, largely through uh, new coal. They want to build 10 gigawatts of new coal. So um, we really want to support them and kind of, um, uh, you know, building out more renewable energy and, and offsetting some of these new coal investments. Uh, so we have a number of partners in the Philippines. Um, I've been working very closely with the Philippines Department of Energy, um, also engaging with the National Renewable Energy Board, the National Energy Association, and partnering with the Philippines Rural Electric Cooperatives Association, or PhilRECA for short, um, to train their members on meeting RPS. Um, and we have a number of development partners uh, listed here. Uh, in terms of industry, we're, we are working most closely with companies within uh, Santa Rosa City. I'll talk a bit more about that model. Next slide. Um, in terms of progress to date, so um, capacity building with distribution utilities and rural cooperatives um, has been one of our kind of key tasks. Um, so really helping um, those smaller utilities understand what their contracting options are um, uh, to buy renewable energy or um, uh, to invest directly in projects or to buy renewable energy certificates. But what are the different ways that these privately owned utilities can invest in renewable energy and meet this policy obligation? Um, we also want to help them understand um, other recent emerging policies uh, like the Green Energy Option Program that enables um, uh, companies to buy uh, offsite renewable energy. Um, and looking at other uh, mechanisms uh, like fast tracking smaller distribution generation projects um, and utilizing uh, power purchase agreements with renewable energy to provide great services. Uh, we also held a webinar with the Philippines Department of Energy um, to train private sector participants on how they could access the Green Energy Option Program. Uh, we've also been working closely with Santa Rosa City, where we developed a memorandum of agreement um, to basically convene uh, large industrials within their city to buy, to help them buy renewable energy. So um, we have also uh, kind of informed this process by uh, surveying their companies to, to do some basically market research and understand um, what the firm's potential interest was in buying renewable energy, what their perceptions are of it, and, and any concerns. Uh, we also uh, did a training with them uh, in March um, of this year where we brought in 50 city officials and private business stakeholders um, to help them understand their renewable energy purchasing options and to identify ways we could work together uh, to help them buy that renewable energy. Next slide. Um, so I won't go into this in depth, but um, some initial learnings uh, for the Philippines. So there are barriers remaining um, for firms to buy on-site generation. Um, so one that we heard earlier in the Bangladesh example um, is, is net metering. So these policies are, are very important uh, in terms of enabling um, project owners to sell elect excess electricity back into the grid. Um, but there's some limitations in the Philippines in terms of what uh, project sizes are, are eligible for that policy. Um, so it kind of um, incentivizes uh, installing smaller projects in some cases. Um, there are a number of other challenges around tax incentives and, and complex regulations as well. Um, for offsite renewable energy deployment, um, there are some emerging uh, policy opportunities in terms of that uh, green energy option program that I mentioned. Um, however, that's still in development and some uncertainty remains about the exact design of that policy. Um, we are also looking into ways that Santa Rosa City um, can um, kind of further uh, incentivize or create positive environments for um, its companies to buy renewable energy. So, um, you know, mechanisms like environmental codes, building codes, um, setting targets and other um, kind of leadership platforms are, are some of the opportunities we're looking into and are developing a policy paper around those ideas. 
Um, we've also learned that distribution utilities are, you know, really uh, should be seen as key investors within the Philippines. Um, many are privately owned. Um, however, there's, uh, I think, a lot of work uh, that we can do um, to help uh, all these utilities understand, you know, the full array of options uh, that they have in terms of buying and investing in renewable energy. Next slide. Uh, so some next steps. So um, just very quickly, uh, working with companies in Santa Rosa to, to do perhaps an aggregated renewable energy procurement. Uh, we'll be developing a RPS planning tool for distribution utilities to help them calculate on a rolling basis what their obligations are. Um, we'll be sharing um, kind of the policy ideas uh, with Santa Rosa in terms of how they can work with businesses um, to help help them buy renewable energy within their city. Um, we will continue um, capacity building with rural cooperatives and are developing a train the trainers program uh, with Phil Reca. We'll continue also engaging with the Department of Energy um, to help feed up learnings from these various efforts. Uh, next slide. So moving on uh, to Vietnam. Um, Bethany, would you mind if we could see if we could get Yasomi in to cover uh, Peru quickly and then come back to you for Vietnam? She was having technical issues. Hi, John. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We're going to just move back. Um, and... John, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, I can brilliant. Hear you. I can hear you perfectly. So I'm going to try and uh, move all the way back to Peru. Apologies, everyone. There we go. Okay, great. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, so the work in Peru is quite interesting because it's unique in the fact that it's the only country in the program for which the primary focus is an energy generation or energy access. Um, so the image that you can see on the screen at the moment is from a news story in 2016 and it shows the El Milagro um, unlined open air dump site, which is in Trujillo, which is the third largest city in Peru and it currently receives the vast majority of the city's waste. Um, the population in Peru today has surpassed 32 million, and Peru now generates around 20,000 tonnes of solid waste a day. And there's more landfills now, over 30, but this is completely insufficient for the demand. And outside of Lima, many of the principal cities in Peru don't have sanitary landfills, and waste is sent to dump sites like the one in this image. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, thanks. So in Peru, we received strong steer from our political partner, which is the Department of Climate Change that sits within the Ministry of Environment, also known as MINAM. And we were given strong steer to focus on the waste management sector and specifically the final disposal of waste um, and so that being the construction of landfills and emissions reductions technologies and leachate evaporation technologies. And this is partly due to the fact that MINAM had developed a NAMA for the waste sector a few years ago, which highlighted final disposal of municipal solid waste as an area with potential for private sector investment. So we started by developing concept notes to analyze three different technologies at two different sites in Peru proposed to us by MINAM. These concept notes contained information on the existing waste management situation in these two locations, um, as well as baseline information on waste volumes and projected landfill gas emissions from the landfills and an evaluation of three potential emissions reductions technologies against a number of criteria that we developed. The two sites that we looked at were Trujillo, which is, as I mentioned, the third largest city in Peru. At this site, we looked at three different types of landfill gas capture technologies and concluded that a landfill gas capture and energy generation technology would be the most appropriate for this site and it would be the most financially viable and have the greatest impact. The other site is San Juan Baptista, which is in the Quito's region of Peru in the Amazon. And we looked at um, landfill gas capture and leachate collection technologies um, and concluded that as this landfill would be too small to generate sufficient gas for energy generation for sale, the most appropriate technology was a leachate evaporator powered by 
a captured landfill gas. Um, the next part of this project was developing detailed investment cases for the chosen technologies at each site, which include proposed operational models and financial structuring for the construction and operation of the landfill site and proposed technologies, as well as financial projections and analysis of the non-financial impacts of the project. So if we move on to the next slide, I'll cover some of the learnings today. Well, when we started, we found that in Peru, there's been very limited private investment in the waste sector and quite a low level of involvement from private sector companies in the operation of waste management facilities. And this is because municipal governments have typically held the responsibility for waste management activities within their municipalities. Um, and actually with a lack of regulation on standards for waste management until very recently, um, many of the existing waste disposal sites are online dumps without systems to collect and treat leachate or capture landfill gas emissions. Um, but following the introduction of a new law on solid waste management in 2017, the government of Peru has developed plans for the construction of 32 new landfills with higher standards for environmental protection. But unfortunately, many have not secured finance yet, and none of these have secured finance from the private sector. And there's an initiative between the Inter-American Inter Development Bank and the Japanese International Corporation Agency that exists at the moment to provide development finance for the construction of some of these landfills, but many do not have additional emissions reductions technologies incorporated into these um, plans. And another one of the learnings that we found through our interactions with different uh, private sector actors was that the private sector has expressed interest in investing in waste management in the past, but have felt that municipal governments are reluctant to cede responsibility or to collaborate with the private sector because there's not very many examples or experiences of that happening in the past. So in terms of next steps on the next slide, um, Peru is a bit further behind in the work packages than uh, Bangladesh, um, and this is largely due to various political situations and elections and shuffles within ministries, which have caused delays over the past year or so. It's made it harder for us to coordinate with local actors to gain the information that we required for our anal analysis for the investment cases, and also made it a bit difficult to coordinate with the different actors within the Ministry of Environment. But um, the next part of the project is focused on improving the enabling environment for private investment into the waste sector. And as part of this, we're working on designing and developing investment mobilization measures to address some of the barriers to private sector investment that we've encountered so far. Um, we've learned that there exists a couple of investment promotion mechanisms in Peru, such as a work for taxes scheme and renewable energy auctions, but actually, um, these have been used to mobilize investment into some infrastructure projects, but haven't been applied to the waste sector. And this is because for various reasons, the way they're currently structured aren't entirely compatible with landfill construction projects. So we are analyzing these types of policy mechanisms at the moment, along with other investment mobilization measures, uh, using learnings from experiences in other countries to understand how they might be applied to improve the bankability of sanitary landfill projects in Peru and to eventually make policy recommendations to the government. And following this, we plan to conduct meetings or workshops with industry groups and investors and private sector actors to understand how they can be engaged to take these priority projects forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yasami. Um, that, that was very interesting. So we're going to move now back to Bethany Spear in, in Denver, Colorado, to talk us through Vietnam. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yes. Yeah, so Vietnam. Uh, moving back to the uh, clean energy investment accelerator model that's really focused on uh, driving uh, commercial and industrial investment in renewable energy. Um, so there, we're really seeking to work with multinational companies, their supply chains, um, and as well as uh, you know regional industrial parks and, and local players uh, to help them invest in renewable energy. 
And the next one. Um, so in terms of kind of framing around Vietnam's, um, you know, priorities, uh, they really have a number of efforts uh, that seek to um, build out the renewable energy market. Um, and they have uh, several um, uh, complementary uh, uh, national strategies and growth plans, um, which are referenced here. Um, so they're definitely clear uh, government leadership uh, in terms of, of wanting to drive um, investment towards these technologies. Um, and they really need to do this uh, in part similar to uh, the Philippines. Um, in Vietnam, there's also very rapidly increasing electricity demand. Um, however, there's um, some um, challenges in terms of enabling uh, the utility to meet that. Um, Vietnam's power sector structure is quite a bit different from the Philippines, um, but um, there are uh, challenges there as well, um, namely that the utility has some limited ability to, to really invest in new projects. Uh, so in Vietnam, uh, working closely uh, with the Ministry of Industry and Trade, Ministry of Planning and Investment, um, and others, um, we're also coordinating um, with uh, the number of other development partners like USAID, GIZ, 3GI, and, and the Partnership for Growth. And, and we really have a very strong network of, of industry uh, players as well. Um, so building off the, the Global Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance that brings together um, those multinationals that have made 100% um, renewable energy commitments and others. Uh, we're also working um, uh, closely with uh, locally based companies and have uh, developed a, a very robust working group um, of all these entities. Next slide. Um, so progress to date. So on the uh, policy pillar that I mentioned earlier, um, we have uh, supported um, USAID in terms of of providing market intelligence and doing interviews uh, with the private sector to inform a recent rooftop solar market study. Um, we've also been doing a lot of work around identifying uh, project pipelines. So um, one uh, recent success was working with Amada, which is a very large uh, conglomerate of industrial parks in Southeast Asia, and they have parks in, in Vietnam as well, and we helped them uh, do a 100% kilowatt uh, project on site and are hoping to work with them to look at other solutions uh, to providing um, renewable energy power for their tenants on their industrial park as well. Um, we've also been um, developing RFPs and, and working with other companies um, throughout the process. So Unilever is, is one example there. And we're working closely with uh, the Global Green Growth Institute, uh, which is leading efforts around designing a solar uh, finance facility. Uh, in terms of, of really supporting um, replication and, and learning kind of based on um, you know, these examples and, and other ongoing work that we have, um, we've been utilizing partnerships and, and platforms like the Partnership for Growth um, where we were able to um, kind of feed into high-level dialogues um, with the Prime Minister of Vietnam. So helping them uh, understand the opportunity um, for enabling corporate procurement of renewable energy. Uh, we've also uh, been developing a variety of analysis and tools, uh, for example, a self-screening tool for companies um, to help them understand if, if their project site is good for solar. Next slide. Um, so, so some learning. So, um, you know, different uh, kind of challenges depending on if you're looking at on-site or off-site uh, renewable energy. Right now, uh, really the only viable solution um, is for on-site solar in Vietnam. And oftentimes those projects are somewhat um, undersized given the net metering regime, um, which really does, for, for a lot of customers, does not um, incentivize um, feeding in uh, excess generation into the grid. Um, there are some other challenges. Uh, there are limitations in terms of um, rooftop uh, solar system sizes, where if you're looking at a project more than one, uh, that's larger than one megawatt, then you need to go through a more extensive uh, permitting process. Um, however, a lot of the 
um, you know, big uh, manufacturers and industrials, they really want to be able to invest in much larger projects, like more on the two to five megawatt size. Um, for offsite, uh, currently no real options there, although we've been working closely with um, USAID to help them uh, uh, in their partnership with the Vietnam government to launch a direct power purchase agreement structure that would enable direct business to business uh, renewable energy sales. Uh, next slide. So some ne next steps, um, we will continue to work with um, companies to help them through the procurement process and to um, uh, basically develop uh, models that can be replicated and we'll be sharing those um, throughout our networks. Um, so we'll be working both with single buyers as well as aggregated pools of buyers uh, like Amata Industrial Park. Um, we will also continue to bring in corporate voices into the policy process, so getting feedback from the private sector on uh, draft regulations, for example, and helping um, government and utility stakeholders understand how these um, regulations are, are perceived by the private sector. Uh, we will also continue convening our working group of corporate and industrial renewable energy buyers, developers, investors, um, to help them uh, stay educated on the policy environment as, as um, kind of incentive structures and regulations continue to evolve rapidly. We'll also be developing um, a corporate buyer's guidebook to help those companies um, sort through procurement options themselves. Next slide. Great. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, John. Thanks, Bethany. Um and apologies for interrupting you between Philippines and, and Vietnam. So lastly, before we take questions, I'm going to pick out some of the merging lessons from the project. Um, we, we have an ongoing learnings work stream and, this, the, and the team will be diving deeper into countries and emerging lessons in our webinar series over the next year. Um, we can see from the country feedback that the change is incremental. A lot of our work is in the policy space and more than anything, the, the private sector is looking for consistently applied policies without ambiguity so they can build um, business cases going out 10 years. So, for example, in the Philippines, the, the rapidly changing policy environment, which um, Bethany talked about, adds project risks. And in other examples of policy reforms in Kenya, we built the case for the removal of VAT and import tariffs on bioethanol. On, on sorry, bioethanol in order to make to to grow the market for clean cooking fuels. In Ethiopia, for example, we're looking at a range of policy changes to support the, the mini grid sector for rural energy access. Moving on to capacity, um, it's a significant barrier in all countries, and part of our role is to to address capacity constraints where they exist. Often policies are in place, but capacity doesn't exist to implement them. So, for example, in, in Dominican Republic, we've focused on supporting the enabling environment for energy efficiency and addressing capacity gaps to support renewable energy. Um, in Ethiopia, our capacity strategy has been to develop a comprehensive financial model that will allow public sector stakeholders to understand key sensitivities of the, of the business case in, in growing the sector. We're also identifying challenges faced by the private sector involved in licensing generation and selling at each government office. Capacity gaps in Vietnam, we're supporting uh, build, uh, capacity building to impl implement net metering policies. Um, moving on, leadership is a critical issue and, and to drive this work forward, we, we need to identify and support champions who can provide the necessary leadership at all levels. Um, talking about using public finance, um, IDCOL in, in Bangladesh is part of the reason that they've had some success in, in a couple of the success, their sectors has been the highly concessional debt finance that they've, they've provided. And, tax rebates and other pu uh, public finance instruments we're seeing being used in, in some of the countries. And we, as I mentioned earlier, we're making the case for this in, um, in Kenya. 
And lastly, um, moving on to competition between public and, and, and private sector. And, and this is often an issue. And in Peru, we see it in the landfill space where bringing in private investors requires the local authority relinquish, to relinquish some control over the waste sector. And this has proved challenging. And in Ethiopia, for example, we, and, and other countries, we see extension of the grid creating uncertainty about, uh, amongst private investors who are concerned, and often with good reason that their off-grid investments will be compromised when the, when the grid arrives. arrives. Okay, I think um, I'm going to start focusing on some questions, and um, I'm going to, so we're going to hand over to the first questions are around, um, Let's have a look through here. So in Bangladesh, and I'm wondering if you could address this, Arish. Um, we, we have a question about if, um, if your presenter could go into more detail about, fi about findings of um, reduced level of market private sector engagement due to public investment. Um, so. Yeah, more, sure. Yeah. Um, right. So in the off-grid solar sector, um, there are just a handful of uh, names um, that are the major investors. Um, so there is the infrastructure development company, ITCO, uh, Bangladesh, the, the Central Bang uh, Bank of, of Bangladesh, um, the Agriculture Development Corporation, and the Rural Electrification Board. Um, with all of these, it's um, their, their financing schemes uh, are more grant oriented. So they have a, a combination of grant loan equity or grant and loan um, structures and schemes um, with the grant component being either between 40 to 50%. So basically what happens is that the project developers um, are more oriented towards using these grant subsidized financing schemes because that slashes your initial payback cost by half or by 40% at the very least. Um, so the project developers choose to go to these um, government um, institutes to access the grant subsidized investments instead of commercial banks or private investors who are asking for um guarantees for 100 percent of loan um and and that in itself is a big ask for for these project developers that that aren't as established as well um to be able to provide uh, guarantees for 100 percent of the loan whereas for for these grant subsidized financing schemes you only have to provide guarantee for 20 percent or 30 percent of the loan the rest is, is a grant and, and then th there's obviously a portion of equity which they go into with their private partners. Um, so basically that, that's the main reason why there is a, a, a reduced kind of level of private uh, investors engagement in this sector. There are a, a number of cases, one or two, where commercial banks have um, invested in these projects so one or two solar mini grid projects and one or two solar irrigation pump projects are invested by private commercial banks. Uh, there's one by Uttara Bank. Um, however, these have only worked because the two parties knew each other. So the investors and the project developers knew each other and they decided to go with this because they wanted to circumvent some of the, the more kind of robust and, and stricter technical standards that it call um, and these other government institutes have um, and obviously they were a big party so they had enough uh, guarantee um, to de-risk this investment for the commercial banks so this is why um, there is lesser private investor um, in this sector in Bangladesh. Thank you Rich. Um, we're going to hand over the next three questions to Kamlashan, um, sitting next to me here in Cape Town. Kamlashan, and so we have um, someone in, has, uh, Pascal Nahasi has, has raised three questions. How SSN plans to encourage those who've already built householder small biogas plants? Um, 
a question around Kenya and power pricing is, is very high in the in balance and power systems. And the question of don't you, uh, f around flexibility to integrate bioethanol and a question around uh, capacity building. Great, thanks John. Um, so I'll just touch on the differences. Um, so the first question about biogas plants. So um, I think that was mostly um, undertaken by the Dutch government. And I think initially they rolled out about 6,000 biogas plants at the household level. Um, so a biogas is not uh, the same as bioethanol. This is this uh, program specifically focused on liquid bioethanol that would be used for cooking specifically. Um, but in, in the case of how do we get, you know, in, enhanced um, uh, participation from rural communities uh, regarding bioethanol um, within the bioethanol master plan. Uh, so one of the focus would be on downstream, which would be on kind of smallholder farmers being able to produce feedstock for bioethanol production and therefore drive the demand as well and be part of the process. So um, that's the first question that, uh, that I've tackled. Um, the, the second one is about um, price points. So um, uh, what's important to note in our program is that bioethanol for, as a cooking fuel targets a very specific market share within Kenya. That is the urban poor living in in the big cities in Kenya. Um, and price is very much related to the energy type and therefore determines the competition between different types of energies. So for example, LPG would be too pricey for the market share that we are looking to attract within the bioethanol market. Uh, so therefore, um, Therefore, bioethanol doesn't really compete so much with LPG, but rather it competes more with kerosene and, um, and, 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 and obviously charcoal. And that, that will probably continue in the short term. The truth is that it, bioethanol is, is probably not going to be the energy type that is going to compete with LPG in the long term, just because the use of it in terms of um, its use in the home as a cooking fuel may not be, it may not be attractive to the market share that would use LPG and therefore it doesn't really compete anyway. Um, the third part is about capacity. Um, and, and your point is noted that, you know, uh, at times capacity is done very ad hoc and it's done by training programs. And one of the ways that SSN really tries to negate this is by having a country engagement lead in, in Kenya and, and Ethiopia who engages consistently with the Kenyan and Ethiopian government to make sure that the capacity uh, is streamlined over time and it isn't just in, um, yeah, in, little, uh, in little pots over the duration of the project. Um, we are also looking at having embedded capacity within the different uh, government ministries uh, to ensure that uh, you know, the learning from that individual can be taken forward and embedded within uh, different ministries uh, in Kenya and Ethiopia. Thank you, Kanashan. Um, the next question I would like to pose to Bethany, and there's, the question is around um, the Philippines. It seems they have a vertically integrated power market. How do you plan to foster competition in the energy sector? Bethany, would you, would you be able to get that? Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, um, so uh, the Philippines, you know, it's mostly uh, consistent of, of these distribution utilities, um, which in themselves are, are integrated in terms of distribution and generation. Um, however, you know, I think there are still opportunities for us to support competition, uh, but it's more on the uh, distributed generation side of things. So, um, you know, working with um, commercial and industrial off takers to help them understand what their options are 
uh, in terms of buying renewable energy and really making them active uh, customers instead of um, you know just paying utility bills, but helping them understand how they can um, buy power directly from um, uh, from you know developers through third party finance deals or um, eventually through offsite projects um, under the green energy option program. Um, we'll also be helping developers um, to be uh, to, to basically foster development of um, kind of the, the developer and investor side of things. So, um, you know, doing market analysis and guidebooks. Uh, so hopefully more developers in the market are, you know, have better capacity and um, that kind of also uh, fosters more competition. Thank you. Thanks, Bethany. Um, question uh, for, for our region, Bangladesh. Are you aware of the work of the Copenhagen Consensus Institute in Bangladesh um, under the direction of Bjorn Lomborg? The consensus conducted a cost-benefit analysis for methods of adapting to climate change. Do you think this analysis played a role in the development in the country? And you think more countries should implement the strategy to get the most out of their sustainable development? I, I don't know if you're aware of uh, the work of the Com Copenhagen Consensus Institute, um, Arij. Um, yeah, um, not in that much detail, um, but just the um, understanding of where they began and the process they took because they've engaged um with our team there um yes i think that this analysis would be useful for other countries as well and this is probably something that should have been the basis of the climate action plans the ndc's that the countries had to submit for unfccc so in an ideal world this would be an analysis that underpins um the climate plans for each country um but with, with analysis like these, there is also the downside, um, especially when, it's, when it has a multi-sectoral focus, um, because economic development still gets preference over climate action itself, because not every climate action is going to make economical sense. Um, there, there's more urgent need for it, but then if you compare it to what needs to be done. I mean, even with this study, it, it, it does talk about prioritizing um, coal usage because that makes the economical sense for Bangladesh to do that. Um, and obviously, they don't produce that much carbon emissions um, uh, if, if their global um, proportion is taken into account. But I mean, it doesn't make sense for countries to go back um, and not go for it, you know what I mean? So yes, definitely these analyses would help um, the countries and should definitely be done, but then we also need to look at both the pros and cons of such analyses. Thank you, Arij. Um, I'd like to hand over the next question to my colleague Kamla Shan. Um, uh, question from Mona Bestet, uh, is there really a benefit in investing in policies such as carbon taxes and other preventative methods if investment in new renewable energy systems is clearly more beneficial in combating climate change? Great. Um, thanks, Mona. Um, I think it, it really isn't a question of being more beneficial. I think uh, in terms of climate change, I think, you know, it, it's well documented that it definitely will be. I think it's more about facilitating the demand for, for, for greater uptake of renewable energy systems and implementation. Carbon taxes are really um, policies that are designed to kind of facilitate that demand by taxing uh, more heavily on fossil fuel emissions. Um, and therefore that can facilitate the demand to, to basically quicken the speed at which we transition towards renewable energy systems. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Kanashan. Um, just going through some of the, the in fact, Kanashan, there might be another question here from James Kungu who asks, how do you ensure that bioethanol is not used in making illicit uh, brew, in other words, alcohol for drinking? Um, yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that's a good question. And it's, um, it's something that 
um, that is within this, uh, the, um, the thinking of the team because um, it is a problem currently in Kenya. So, so there's two parts of this. Um, currently, the, the, tech, the bioethanol that is used for clean cooking is there is a dye that is inserted within it when it is produced that, that basically means that it's a technical ethanol and therefore it's not used for, um, for um, anything besides cooking. So therefore it can't be, can't be used to make um, alcoholic beverages that can be consumed. However, I, I note that, you know, even though that this is done at a factory level or a manufacturing level, it may not actually cause the, um, you know, it may not actually deter people from actually drinking this alcohol. Um, the second part of it is really about standards and, and safety. Um, currently, a lot of the models that require distribution um, through, um, through, uh, the current oil and gas network negate any problems of, um, of, of, of this kind of thing happening. However, the use of bioethanol um, can, the use of bioethanol in, in a way that, that can be detrimental to people can be, um, can be addressed firstly by greater capacity building, which is something that we'll focus on and something that private sector organizations already are doing firstly within um, first of all, approaching the, the, the Kenyan Safety Standards Bureau, um, but then also, un, uh, you know, also doing their own capacity building about the dangers of bioethanol and how they can be appropriately used. Um, the company that, um, that is selling a lot of the bioethanol within Kenya also produces the stoves and the the, the actual bioethanol canister fits directly into the bioethanol stove and therefore it, it doesn't allow for anything to be um, directly um, consumed from the stove itself. Thank you, Kandashan. Um, I think that's, that's all we've got time for. I'd like to thank everyone that uh, attended the webinar today and I'd like to thank my colleagues on the team. Um, and just like to say that this, this, the webinar will be posted up to the, to the South, South, North and the CDKN website. And any, uh, any questions that we've missed will be answered by email. Thank you very much. Please, there's a, there's a poll and we'd really appreciate the three questions. We'd really appreciate it if you could give us some feedback that'll help us to um, continue to improve. Thank you, everybody.